live on Facebook. Yep, I can see Good that. evening and welcome to our latest in conversation. This evening I am pleased to be joined by author James Oswald. Um, Exeter Library is one of 54 libraries run by the charity Libraries Unlimited in Devon and Torbay. Um, these events are free but if you would like to make a donation to, to Libraries Unlimited there is a link in the chat. So welcome James, thank you for joining us this evening. So James well, thank is, you for inviting me. Thank you. James is joining us all the way from Scotland this evening um, and by day he is the farmer of Highland cows and sheep and by night he writes disturbing fiction which I can definitely, I've been listening to your first book this week and I can definitely say <laughs> that that definitely takes a disturbing fiction. Um, I, I do love the audio books, they are very well done. Yes. Um, Ian, really... Ian Han was a brilliant narrator. It's really good. Um, so what will burn is James's latest book, which is number 11 in the uh, Inspector McLean, 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 McLean. McLean. I, 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 I don't usually correct people when they mispronounce it or misspell it because there's so many different ways of pronouncing and saying it. Uh, uh, um, but for me, it's McLean. McLean. Well, we'll stick with McLean. That's good. Um, and he also has two books in the Constance Fairfield series. Um, so, James, would you like to tell us about what will burn? Um, yes, I, I always get this one when, when I, I have a new book out. And, um, and the first question that anyone asks me is, what's it about? <laughs> and I'm usually have written the next book. I'm editing a third one and have absolutely no idea what the book's <laughs> about. Uh, but uh, What Will Burn, uh, as I said, it's the 11th in the series uh, and it, it opens um, with a, a, the discovery of a, a, a dead body of an old woman who lives in a, a cottage in the woods just outside of, of Edinburgh and she's been beaten up and burned to death. And um, the, the story basically is, is Tony McLean, Inspector McLean, trying to find out who would do such a horrible thing and why. Um, and in the background of all of this going on, there's, um, there's some witches have come to town uh, to protest against a group of men's rights activists. Uh, so that I just sort of mix that all in, in together uh, and see what happens. That sounds fascinating. Um, you started writing um, fantasy didn't you um a long time ago so how what drew you to sort of police procedural novels well i actually started writing comics um so comics were my first love and my first ever published story that i got paid money for was a thug's future shock in uh, in um 2000 ad um comic in in december of 1993 so a very long time ago wow. uh, and i really wanted to write comics um and I was, right, I was living in Aberdeen at the time when I was writing comics and I met a, a young fellow called Stuart McBride oh, um, yes, who you may or may not have heard of and, and, uh, and we, we, we got on really well and we collaborated on some comics that ne will never get published because they're a bit rubbish. <laughs> uh, he's a very talented artist though um, but we kept up with each other. I moved out of Aberdeen down to Edinburgh and then down to Wales uh, but we kept up with each other and, and I, Stuart Obviously, he was writing books as, and I was writing, writing books and we used to exchange our manuscripts and talk to each other about them. And then he, he wrote a crime fiction book, um, which was called Granite, which is his first Logan McRae book. And he, he said to me when he got a publishing deal for that, to so stop writing all this nonsense with <laughs> dragons and magic and sheep and stuff, which is what I was doing at the time. <laughs> um, crime fiction is where it's at. Uh, so I, I thought, well, I'll give it a go. Uh, and I wrote a story based on the a character that I'd, um, I'd created for one of the comic scripts back in the early 1990s, this, this Edinburgh-based detective who could just possibly see the supernatural underworld stuff that was going on in the background that nobody else believed in. And that was Tony McLean. Uh, so I, I, I just thought, well, I'll, I'll give it a go. And that was Natural Causes. I wrote, I wrote some short stories to start with, one of which was called Natural Causes. And I then expanded Natural Causes into a novel and uh, no, took it from there, basically. Yeah, yeah so um, I, I think sort of 11 books um, in a series is a sort of great achievement. And is that something, um, can you read them as standalones? I mean, I've started at the beginning with the first ones because I didn't want to go into number 11 and then I've missed like so much stuff. So I, um, or is it best to read them in the order that you intended? I, well, I try to write them 
so that each one is an individual story. Uh, yeah. So you can you can pick up what will burn, and you will you know you will understand it. You might not get every little detail about Tony McLean and 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 the, and the people he works with and, and 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 his sort of friends and family, because you won't have picked that up from the earlier books. Mm-hmm. But it, none of that is actually crucial to the story. Um, obviously, yes, I've been writing him since 1990 one or something as a character so I know him really well but I've been writing him as this character in these books um, since the mid 2000s to 2005 when I first started writing crime fiction and um, and he has grown with with the books and the characters that he he interacts with have come and gone Um, so yeah you will get a little bit extra if you start at the beginning and work your way all the way through um, and I'm sure libraries have got all of the books available. So I have own. seen a lot of your books in our libraries. <laughs> <laughs> they are very, very popular with, with libraries. I, I'm, I'm very pleased about that. But yeah, you can read them all individually uh, as, you know, as standalone books. Um, I, I try, I, I work very hard to make sure that, 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 that you can do that. I guess it's, it's important. It's important, um, obviously, for new readers and then they can, like me, so they can come along and pick up and go, oh, yeah, that's great. I've got 11 more to or nine, or 10 more to read. Or you've probably got, you, you, I know that you've got a lot of fans and they're obviously waiting for you to bring out the next one. Mm. So um, they can be ready to sort of grab it when it's when it's out. It, it is. Uh, it, it's, the, it's the greatest compliment you can get. I get emails on publication day saying, when's the next one coming out? <laughs> they're, they're, it's, it's come in the post in the morning and they've finished it by tea time. Uh, and it's taken me six, eight months to write that <laughs> book and they inhale it in, in, in eight hours. But that, that you know, it, it's annoying, but it's also the, 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 you know, the best compliment you yeah, can get. Yeah, definitely. Writer. Are you, um, do you write sort of one a year? Is it about one a year that you sort of I sort of, um, I've, I've done rather more than that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we're we now in a sort of schedule of bringing out one a year and I've yeah. just started writing the next one, which will come out this time next year. Um, but um, initially, because I, I wrote the first two before getting published uh, and then I self-published them because I oh, couldn't right. find a publisher for them. So I, I, I wrote Natural Causes in about 2005. I started writing it. And um, and I put it in for the Crime Writers Association debut dagger, which it was shortlisted for. Uh, I got so excited by it being shortlisted, even though it didn't win, that I sat down and wrote the next one, the Book of Souls, and that got shortlisted as well. Um, and, and publishers were quite interested at that point, but then nothing came of it. Uh, so I ended up um, self-publishing them uh, in I think two thousand and. 12, so not quite mm. 10 years ago, mm. uh, I brought the first two out and they did really, really well, self-published. And then the publishers were really interested. <laughs> but because the two, first two were already out and I was writing the third one, they um, they brought them out really quickly. So the first one came out in May 2013, ah, the second right. one came out in July, and then the next one came out in February 2014. So we were doing two a year for a while and, uh, and, and that kind of almost broke me because yeah, <laughs> uh, I was imagine. trying to run a farm at the same time. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I think one, one a year is, was good. I know my mm. readers would like me to do a lot more than that. But if I try to write more than that, the quality just goes off a cliff. That's the thing, uh, isn't it? I, you want you want to mm. sort of um, keep that sort of quality and, and sort of keep true to your sort of um, characters. And what sort of makes you want to return to him? Is he like, you know, is he sort of, um, has he become sort of part of you and he's sort of familiar and, and you like him or do you sort of feel compelled that you always want to go back to him because I know some other authors sort of get to a point where they you know want to sort of say goodbye to their uh, their character but you're obviously not there yet push yeah push him gently off a waterfall <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I haven't I haven't got there yet um I it's I mean, 12 books, I, I know what the 12th book's going to be about, but 12 books is a lot for any yeah, series. Uh, um, and, um, but I, I don't think I'm going to kill him at the end of, the, of, of, of book 12, but um, I have got lots of other things that I want to do. So, I, I, you know, I might, I, I've just finished writing another Constance Fairchild book, so that'll be yeah. out before the next Tony McLean one, hopefully. Uh, and, and I'd quite like to do, there's a couple of other things that I've got. Um, so, 
but people keep on demanding Tony McLean stories, and I, you know, I like to, to 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 do what people ask me to. So. Well, I guess while you've still got the stories, and you you've still sort of got that sort of um, you know love of him, then you know it's not too it's not a bad thing to be doing something when people are you know wanting those. I think it's always sad when a series ends. I think the you know I think probably it's sadder. I should imagine it's sad for the author, but it's always sad for the sort of fans yeah. if they've like followed I- them. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think if I, if I got bored of writing him, then I would, I would walk away and yeah. do something. I, um, but I, I think yes, as a writer, yeah, as a writer, I, I'd quite like to do other stuff. I mean, mm. I, I have written as well as the, the, the crime fiction. I have written a fantasy series, the Ballad of Sir Benfro, um, it's a five book series, and I would love to do some more fantasy, so straight out yeah. fantasy. But I, I haven't got the time so, because I, I i i need to write the more mclean books that's what's under contract <laughs> at the moment so i get that, on with that that nicely brings me into a question from serena and also one that i had down which was how do you manage your time between running a farm and writing um your novels because obviously they're both sort of full-time jobs in um a lot of people's worlds well, they, they are. I, I manage my time badly, I mean, it's a simple <laughs> answer. But uh, th- they are both full-time jobs, but the one happens during the day. Uh, farming happens during the day, and then I write at night. So uh, I don't do much else. But uh, I, And I've also um, I've shrunk my farming activity down quite, quite a bit. You, you mentioned at the beginning that I, I, I farm cows and sheep, but I've actually sold all my sheep to my neighbour, um, uh, and he re- he rents the grazing and and and, and uh, for the sheep. I've still got the cows, um, uh, and I do. I think enjoy. your cows are lovely. I've I love uh, the cows. I love their they fringes. They've got such great hair. <laughs> I, I'm I'm kind of working on that myself. I haven't been to an hairdresser in about a year, and I'm I'm slowly becoming one of my cows. Um, but uh, yes, um, but, no, the cows are great, and I, I I do I love working with them, uh, and and it's a it's a pedigree fold that I've built up over the years. So I mean, basically, almost all of the cows on the farm have been born here. I've raised them from calves, and they all know me. So it, it, it's kind of a special thing. Sheep are, are less it's less easy to get you know to get all sort of excited about sheep, um, unless you're an Aberdonian, I believe. But, um, <laughs> uh, so. So yeah, I do the farming work during the day, uh, and these last week or couple of weeks have been a bit of a nightmare with the snow. Because mm. um, I saw some of your everything... pictures on Twitter actually with um, it, the lovely cows it, in the snow. They looked very pretty, but I imagine it's they not. Look, <laughs> yeah, they look really pretty, and and, and it, it is lovely up here when when we've got snow on the ground. Except that the snow drifts over the tracks, and then I can't get the tractor up with the bales of hay, um, so I have to go and dig everything out, uh, or I have to put the um, do stuff on the quad bike and try and get through I got the quad bike stuck the drifts were that deep and um, every, it's just everything takes 10 times as mm. long so uh, yeah I, I get to the end of the day and I sit down to think I've, now I've got to write a couple of thousand words and I just can't be bothered no. I to sleep <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a little bit behind schedule at the moment with with the, the edits that I'm doing on Con Fairchild book three um, because of the snow Oh, we'll just have to blame the weather. I mean, I think at least um, hopefully spring's on its way. I know maybe it takes a little bit longer to get to Scotland um, than it does down in Devon where I am as we're just starting to see um, signs of spring now, but hopefully it won't be too long for you as well. Um, I've got some uh, a nice comment from Eileen who says, your books are wonderful. And she says she feels a real empathy with the way the stories progress. So that's a really nice comment. Oh, thank you, there. Eileen. I like um, you. So... Glenis has asked, will McLean ever meet Con? So I don't know who Con is, so you're going to have Con, to... Con is, is Constance Fairchild, who's the, ah, the, the main ah. character in my other series. And uh, um, in the first of the Con Fairchild books, um, she meets one of the characters, one of the regular characters from the McLean series, but not Tony McLean himself. Um, uh, and I I almost didn't do that. It, was, it, it sort of came about by... Um, by accident really I was I was discussing the plot for the Constance Fairchild book and, and one of the editors at Wild Farm my publisher said um, is is Con ever going to meet Tony McLean um, and, and I, I hadn't really thought about it at that point I, I just sort of assumed that they were different different worlds or different aspects of of the same world uh, but I thought you know why why not and it was actually quite a good prompt because then I had to a story prompt because then I had to think well 
what how would she meet because Constance is based down in London yeah. and the stories are meant to be down you know England and London and but then I thought well how does she get to meet someone who's an Edinburgh detective either he's got to come down to London or more likely she got to Scotland mm. and why would she go up to Scotland and then that would that fed into the story and how, how the story worked out in the end um, but I haven't uh, I haven't actually had Constance meet Tony yet Constance has met a couple of other of, 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 of Tony's colleagues um, and Tony in What Will Burn gets to meet Constance's sister Izzy um, I think I can say that without giving too much of the plot away uh, I'm always worried about spoilers I know I am by the terrified time, <laughs> by the time I've, I've I've written the book I've edited the book I've gone through it a thousand times I've no idea what's a spoiler or not so <laughs> I'm the worst person to ask to to give you a spoiler free review of the book <laughs> Uh, but I think I can safely say that that, that Izzy Fairchild or Izzy de Villiers is 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 in is in what will burn. But um, I have this slight problem with having Constance meet Tony. In that I don't know what Tony looks like. Oh. So if Constance, if I'm writing that book from Constance's point of view, and she goes into a room and sees this man standing there, You're gonna or have she's to introduced him. to him, and I'm going to have to have mm. the, at least a very basic idea of. I'm going to have to describe him and, and uh, I never have over 11 books I've never described him because the way I write the books they're kind of narrated from his point of view and he knows what he looks like so even if he saw himself in the mirror it wouldn't be worth commenting on uh, so um, yeah who, do you think so, I, who, um, who would play him if you if he was gonna if you made a tv series who, who if you well, have a thought who might play him well, that's another question that I get asked quite a lot, and and, and it kind of comes to the same answer, like because I don't really know. I what don't it looks know. Like. Uh, and also, um, I don't. I, I I run the farm during the day. I write the books at night. I don't watch a lot of telly, so I I don't actually really know any contemporary mm. actors um, who. You know, most of the people I can think of are, are too old or too dead. <laughs> uh, yeah, that might uh, be an issue. <laughs> yeah. So they can do wonders with CGI these days, <laughs> I understand. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. And I, I just, I usually throw it back at the uh, uh, whoever's asking the question, well, who would you like to see play Tony McLean? And I get a stream of, of answers of names of people who I then have to go and look up. You have to Google them all. Yeah, maybe you yeah. could have like a competition is, uh, you know, who do you think? So like, like when they do Bond and uh, they'll sort of have like a casting yeah. thing. So... Yeah. Um, you, I mean, your story, your crime stories are not cosy. They wouldn't ever be described as cosy, would they? Particularly with the they're opening. Got, they're cat mysteries, I think. That you can them as. <laughs> I have um, a recurring character who is a cat. Oh, do um, they? Uh, it doesn't turn up until you've only started the first book. The I have, yeah. Turn up until book two. Uh, well, I think the cat might be in book one. Um, belongs I'm to Tony, now. Tony's downstairs neighbour, Mrs. McCutcheon. Uh, Mrs. McCutcheon's cat. But I can't tell you how to only acquires Mrs. McCutcheon's cat without giving too much away so I won't. No well, I'll, I'll, I'll wait for that one I do like I do like a cat so that's good I mean where do you get your ideas from from for your stories because obviously you know writing as sort of prolifically as you have in this series you've obviously got quite a lot of ideas wearing around. Kind of all over the place um, the the ideas the basic idea the theme for for what will burn came because I'd I'd yeah, as my books have this kind of weird, slightly supernatural twist to it, mm -hmm. to them, uh, and, and and I was thinking, well, you know, I've done, I've done demons, I've done uh, the, the devil incarnate, I've done vengeful ghosts. We've had a, uh, we've had a jinn, uh, you know, a, a Middle Eastern genie in one of them. Um, I haven't done witches yet, and witches. There's a lot of stuff going on in Scotland at the moment um, because witches were very badly persecuted. Mm -hmm. You know, three or four hundred years ago, yeah. and and there's a big petition to get them basically all pardoned and to put up a um, because they were all wrongly accused because there's no such thing as witchcraft uh, to get them pardoned and to have a memorial built somewhere for them. And uh, and and I so witches are very much in the news, and I thought well, we could we could do something with witches. And there's been there had been a group of witches, he says, using little bunny ears in, in the, Confair, the first Confair Child book. So I thought we, that, that brings that in together. Yeah. So I, I, I start really with something as, very, as simple as that, um, a very loose idea. Uh, I'm not much of a plotter. Uh, you know, I'll, 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 I'll just come up with a, with a mad idea like the book before, Bury Them Deep. 
um, came about from a couple of Twitter conversations that collided. Uh, someone was going on, someone reminded me of the, the Scottish legend of Sawney Bean, who's this Scottish um, cannibal who used to live in a cave and would prey on travelers and, and, and kill them and eat them and steal all their stuff. Uh, and, um, and then somebody else was going on about doggers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is a, a rather, uh, 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 I won't explain. To, yeah, let's not yeah. go there. It's only let's, let's not go there. But the two collided on my Twitter timeline. So I thought cannibals meet doggers. What can we do with that? And, and that was all I had going in, as it were. Uh, and I just sit down and, and, and what I'll usually do is I'll, I'll come up with a, um, sorry, my, my headphones just popping up. Oh, that's okay. Um, I, I come up with a, what I hope is a very arresting opening scene. Mm. And I'll write that. It's usually a person being murdered or a person coming across something unfortunate. And then I'll throw the detectives at it and see what happens. And I, and I quite often, I'll get to about 30,000 words in and think, I haven't got a clue what's going on. I can't do this. <laughs> uh, do you have any contacts? Enough... Sorry. I was gonna... Sorry, so again? I was going to say, do you have any sort of, do you have any contacts with sort of police when you write them? Or do you, are you sort of winging it I don't I don't I I, I very much wing it I, I started off um I didn't really have any contacts with with uh, with Lothian and Borders Police as it was when I first started writing Police Scotland as it now as it is now and I kind of whenever I needed to know if I found myself needing to know a specific piece of police procedure exactly how the police would do such and such a thing that kind of set off a little alarm in my head because I didn't want to write that kind of book. So I would go back and rewrite the scene so I didn't need to know that piece of, of, of information. Yeah. And, and it's, a, it's a very time consuming way of being lazy because I didn't want <laughs> to do the research. Uh, uh, and I have subsequently been approached by uh, members of Lothian Borders Police who've, who've, uh, and um, Police Scotland who've, who've read the books and either have enjoyed them or have thought, oh Christ, he's making a fool of himself, I better help. <laughs> uh, and, and so I can, and we've got people I can phone up if I need to. But yeah. again, I'm, I'm always trying to sort of buy, veer away from doing that because it's not really the kind of book that I want to write. Uh, I'm much more about the characters, how mm. they interact with each other, um, how they react to the horrible things happening around them, how they deal with the problems than how procedure actually works. Yeah. And every so often, I read a book that's, that's got proper police procedure in it and, and it and, and it kicks off and I think, oh shit, I got that wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> or, I, I better, or I better get that right in the next book or whatever. I think um, we have a couple of questions that have come in and one, that, again, that I was going to ask you is how do you sort of incorporate the supernatural into your novels? Is it, oh, actually, I, I asked how do you, but actually Beth has asked, why do you? Um, and she said, is it a nod to your fantasy roots or is it just because you'd like to make them slightly different? It, it's, it's sort of a, a, all of those things. Uh, it goes back right to the beginning when I first wrote Tony McLean first as a character. He was in a comic script and he was this, uh, the, the, the comic, the, the story, he wasn't even the main character in the comic. The, the, the story was quite similar to, I think it's book, book eight in the series, The Gathering Dark. Um, which, it has, without giving too much away, is, uh, has got a character in it who may or may not be a ghost. And this comic script, there was this ghost in it um, who, who's died and hadn't been identified, his body hadn't been identified. And whilst his body wasn't identified, he was wandering the city as a ghost, causing a certain amount of mayhem. And nobody could see him except for Tony McLean, this Detective Inspector McLean. Yeah. Uh, and that was it worked really well in comics because comics you can get away with that sort of stuff. You know, you can you can leap tall buildings in a single bound and all that <laughs> sort of stuff. And nobody bites an eyelid. And so when it came round to um, trying to write crime fiction, which I'd never done before, um, I I was casting around. Thought, well, I've got this police officer, this police character that I wrote years and years ago. Um, what can I do with him? And it was baked in at the start that he, you know, his unique selling point, his, his key skill was that either he could see the weird stuff or weird stuff happened to him. So it, that's, and, that, and I kind of liked that because nobody mm. else was doing it. I subsequently discovered the reason nobody else was doing it was because publishers wouldn't buy it yeah. and it wouldn't sell. Uh, and, 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 and you'll find, 
I mean, it, it does, but, but also if you pick up any of my books and read the blurb on the back, it doesn't mention... No, well, I was quite surprised. And supernatural. Yeah, I, thought, um, I thought you were just, pl- you know, crime perce- perce- bleh, police yeah. procedural. And when and I started to delve, I found the supernatural. <laughs> the problem is if, if you pick up the book in, 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 in the bookshop or you're browsing through the library or whatever and you turn it over and it says a, ghost, a vengeful ghost is stalking the city, <laughs> people who like crime fiction will put it back down again. Mm. And, then, um, and publishers know this. Uh, and it doesn't matter how good the book is it goes into the horror section and we didn't want to do that because it, it, you know whilst I like a bit of horror I'm a big fan of Stephen King and and and, and CJ Tudor and people like that who write yeah. lovely modern horror books um, it's a difficult sell or it was a difficult sell so the publishers just pitch them as these police procedurals and I focus mostly on that but the crimes are always I like the idea that like in natural causes, you've got a bunch of people who carried out a horrible procedure mm. to raise a demon to try and grant themselves immortality. I hope I'm not giving too much away there. Um, <laughs> no, so either they, either they succeeded or to do the stuff that they had to do, they had to really believe it themselves. So if they believe it themselves, yeah. you write their point, their part of the book as if the demon exists um, because for them it does exist. Uh, and, and I, you know, it makes I, I like it. I like doing it that way anyway. It also means if fascinating. I, get... I, I really like the idea of it. That's what I think that's why I picked up the first one because I thought, oh, this sounds right. You know, I like a police procedural, but you know, stick a ghost or a witch in it, and I'm in. You know, <laughs> but uh, publishing is unfortunately, you know, by necessity quite small c conservative. Um, in that people people will reject something. There's so much choice, mm. that, and they know what they like. And if there's any suggestion that it's a bit different, then they'll move on to the next thing that they like. Yeah. Uh, so you've got to kind of work with it. But once they found it, you know, once they found my books, people love them. And I've sold yeah. hundreds of thousands of copies. Uh, and, and I get invited to talk to people next to library. It's, it's lovely. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yes, you've got, to, you've got to break through that, that barrier yeah. first. That's really, I mean, it's, it's, it's different, isn't it? And I think that um, I've got, I've got loads of questions coming in. They're coming in faster than I can. So I'll do a quick fire range at you. So um, just so we can get through them. So um, a question is, how did you come up with Madame Rose? Completely by accident. Um, I wanted an antiquarian bookseller for, for, for the book. Um, and I had an idea of where they lived. It was a, a, a on, on Leith and, I, and then suddenly as I was just starting the scene it occurred to me antiquarian bookseller could also be a tarot reader and whatever why not and then as Tony McLean went up the stairs and into the reception to talk to this person it struck Madame Rose came to me just as it and at start to start with she was a joke she was kind of a, almost a throwaway joke she was only meant to be in the one book anyway and, and I just wanted to to have Tony McLean struggling with how to deal with mm. uh, a trans woman uh, and not, not knowing and learning over the course of the book. Uh, but she was so popular that I just had to keep bringing her back. Um, and I'm stuck with her now. <laughs> oh, that's good. It's, it's good to have I mean, when people, you know, when characters sort of, you know, people fall in love oh, with Oh, I them. love it. Yeah, when, when characters come alive, it's, yeah. it's, it's brilliant, yes. Um, are there any locals who help you with your characterization? Probably you can't say unless there might be somebody watching. <laughs> no, not really. No, I'm 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 very much a you know a, a loner. Um, I, I don't know if that that question is sort of angling towards um, do I base my characters on people? I yeah, um, I think possibly. And again, I I, I don't really. I, I, I do sometimes name my characters after people. Sometimes quite deliberately. Uh, I mean, for the first five <laughs> books. Um, there was a detective constable, Stuart McBride, as a nod to Stuart for getting <laughs> me into this game in the first place. And, and detective constable Janie Harrison, who's in the later books, is named after my godmother, Janie, ha- or Janie Harrison was her, was her maiden name. Uh, and, and she, as my godmother, bought me book tokens for my birthday and Christmas every year and still does to this day. Oh, I, bless. You know, I, I, so... Um, and so she kind of gave me the gift of reading. So I, I put her in my books and, and torture her slightly um, <laughs> by way of saying thanks. So I, I, I and I use names that way. Uh, and I sometimes think 
I think about how people I know react. And I'll watch people in the streets, in the, in the supermarkets, not so much this last year, because I haven't really been out much. No, but, you happening. know, <laughs> most writers are, you know, are, are people watchers. Mm. And you pick up little snippets of conversation or the way people interact with each other. And that feeds into my characters a lot. But most of it is just in my head. Did, do you believe in ghosts, Eileen has said? I don't. I don't believe. I think I, I struggle with the concept of belief. Mm. Um, like Tony, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a proper agnostic. Um, and uh, I think I would love it if ghosts did exist. I, I think that, you know, a, a world with ghosts in it would be much more interesting than a world without <laughs> ghosts. And I'd say the same about aliens and UFOs and stuff, but I've, I have no direct experience. So um, I think it's, it's like the, uh, the X-Files, Spooky mm. Mulder's poster. I want to believe, but <laughs> I, I can't just believe. I, I, need, I need a bit of evidence. Yeah. Um, do you, um, how important, well, I'll get my words out, how important is place in your novel? So, because they're set in Edinburgh, aren't they? Which, um, you know, a lovely city, definitely on my list to go. Um, yeah quite sort of an atmospheric city isn't it does that sort of help when you're do you know do you know Edinburgh well it does. I, I well I not as well as I thought I did uh, <laughs> um, I, I I lived there for a long time uh, well I lived outside of Edinburgh I lived in Roslyn for, for five years my yeah. partner was doing her PhD and and, and I used to work in Edinburgh uh, I worked just off Leith Walk in a call centre which is why that area turns up in the books quite a lot yeah uh, and um and, and the Midlothian area around Roslyn turns up quite a lot in the books as well because I lived there and I used to walk around there and stuff. Um, setting is absolutely crucial for these books. I think Edinburgh really lends itself to the sort of darkly, slightly gothic ghost mm. stories uh, because it's got that layered history to it and it's, I mean, physically layered as well. Uh, so, I, I, and I do like to use the city that way. Um, but as I say, I get it wrong sometimes. I, I, when I wrote the first two books, I was living in Wales. I was working on a research farm in Wales and um, before I came back to Scotland to take on the family farm. And I had, for my reference, I had a couple of Ordnance Survey land ranger maps of Edinburgh pinned up on my study wall. And I was remembering the places where I'd worked, um, one of which was just off Leith Walk, as I say, I was Standard Life yeah. Bank had a big call centre there. And um, just north of there is Trinity, and I remember I used to walk around in my lunch break just to get a bit of fresh air. And it was a pretty down market part of town round the call center, but that wasn't Trinity. Trinity's really posh. It's where all the judges and lawyers, <laughs> so I'm told. But I, I described Trinity in natural causes as being full of drug addicts and prostitutes. And I got a really very snooty email from someone um, <laughs> telling me that that was actually, that was wrong. Uh, uh, that was where all the, all, all the lawyers and uh, judges lived, to which I, I emailed them back and said, well, I rest my case. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I get things wrong, but uh, I remind myself that it's, it's you know, it's it's a slightly different Edinburgh to the one. Exactly. That, that and it's visit. fiction, isn't it? I think I was, yeah. that's one thing that you have to sort of say, isn't it? Is that, you know, not everything's perfect because it is, it's not real. It is fiction. And actually leads nicely into a, a question from Carrie, who lives in Edinburgh. Um, and um, Sorry, <laughs> she knows the places that Tony wanders into. Um, but she said, have you thought about him wandering further afield into other places in Scotland? Well, he has a bit. Um, he's, he's come up to Fife uh, in, which book was it now? Dead Men's Bones. He, he investigates uh, a murder-suicide in a house in northeast Fife, um, which actually is just across the hill from from my farm it's uh, and I, I i kind of slightly self-indulgently set that that um crime there so that i could have tony go visit this frankly quite horrific not cozy at all crime scene <laughs> um and he's so harrowing he's so sort of he needs to go for a walk to clear his head afterwards mm. and he, he walks out to the house and he goes up the hill um and it's a lovely, lovely evening. And then as he's walking back down, he suddenly realizes that he's surrounded by Highland cows. He's been so deep in thought, he hasn't noticed. And that's my Highland cows on my hill. And I was uh -huh. basing the house on, on a, there's a big sort of mansion house just across the way from here. Um, and there's another, uh, he comes, he goes to Fife for another one as well, which is a house that my sister lived in when she was a student at St. Andrews. Um, so, but the, the problem is if you take, 
um, if you take Tony too far out of Edinburgh, you couldn't do it for a whole book because mm -hmm. Edinburgh is one of the characters. As we were saying before, setting is so important. Yeah. So I couldn't, I could send him up to Aberdeen to go to a funeral. Yeah. Uh, but I but couldn't send him up back. to Aberdeen to do an investigation. No. Um, and I, and whereas Constance Fairchild, on the other hand, uh, in the first book, she's London based, but she ends up going up to, to Edinburgh and then back down to London. Second book, um, she spends a bit more time in Edinburgh. Um, third book that I'm writing at the moment, she spends most of the time in Wales, in Aberystwyth. So um, she goes all over the place. She's a bit more but of a jet setter than Tony. Yeah, well, she, and, and she's also, she's working for the for National Crime Agency. So she's kind of, she's with the feds rather than the, uh, the local police. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Would you co-write with another author um, from Eileen? I don't know. Um, I, I mean, years ago when I was doing comics, that, mm. that's quite collaborative. And I, and I, and I, I remember Stuart and I did a, a, a comic script um, and spent an entire day in a pub rewriting it. Um, and it got worse and worse as the day went on because <laughs> we were drinking an awful lot of beer. Uh, I'm, I'm not very, I'm, I'm very sort of independent and self-contained. I'm not very good at sharing mm. or asking for help. Which is which is the other the other side of the coin, I guess. Um, which isn't to say that I couldn't do, um, but I, I I'm not sure who would want to work with me. To be honest, well, it's quite difficult, isn't it? Because obviously you you may have completely different styles. I know I know some um, authors that sort of write a chapter each, don't they? So, but I always think that must be you know that would be that well, one. One novel that I read recently, which I really very much enjoyed, is by um, Laura Lamb and Elizabeth May, which is called Seven Devils. It's just a science fiction um, space adventure thing. Uh, and, and they wrote it, you know, emailing each other chapters and whatever. And, and, and it works really, really well. Mm -hmm. But um, it's not something I've ever tried. Uh, um, but I don't know how adventurous I'm feeling. So... Um... Do you have? I'm going to ask you the asking you what, what your favourite children are. Is it? Do you have a favourite novel? Do you have a favourite book that you've written? Um, I don't. I don't really know. It changes with the seasons. Mm. Uh, do I have a favourite author? Might be a. It would be Terry Pratchett. Yeah. Uh, uh, with no question. No question there. Um, but also Ian Banks because I I remember you know reading Ian Banks and the and M Banks for his his science fiction culture yeah. novels. Uh, uh, was a huge influence on my writing. He he kind of showed me that you didn't have to be constrained by genre because he just you know did whatever he wanted to and, okay. uh, and but did it so brilliantly. But um, if I had to pick one book like to keep on a desert island, I I would I would well, probably want a book with blank pages so I could learn it myself. <laughs> you could write your own. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I always think I'd, I'd always have to take a big one. I'm thinking like War and Peace or sort of Les Mis or something that's you know could keep me going for a while. Or you wouldn't get fed up with, but yeah. But it's um, we're nearly... I wouldn't mind a short book. It would have to be a short book that I didn't mind reading over and over again. Yeah, something that you really uh, really uh, like. So um, yeah, do you read crime have... yourself? I know you don't have a great deal of time, but do you read anybody else's? I do. I, I've, I'm I'm reading. Um, I, I get sent loads of of proof copies, advanced yeah. copies to, for, for blurbs. Uh, uh, I'm reading Matthew Frank's new one at the moment, um, which is, is very good, um, but not out until later in the year. Um, I, what was the last one I read before that was Imran Mahmood's new one, which is absolutely superb. I'm trying to remember what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know what I saw, that's what it's called. Uh, I was just looking around because it's on the, on the bookshelf behind uh -huh. me. Um, I, but I don't get a lot of time to read, no. I, I, as you can imagine. I, I listen to a lot of audio books because mm. um, I can do that whilst I'm doing it out on the farm. Uh, so, but that tends, I tend to listen to books that I would choose for myself. And I read books that other editors have thought I might like. You get sent, um, yeah. Yeah. And, and so I do, I do read a, you know, a fair amount of crime fiction. Um, I wish I had more time to read. That would be, I'd love to be able to just sit down and read a book, mm. you know, take a day or two days or whatever to read a book in big chunks. Um, but I don't get the time. So I get an hour before bed, bed um, and quite often it's not an hour because I wake up in the middle of the night with a book on my, on my face. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
he'd always read to the cows to the cows um I guess at this time of the year as well it's pretty much dark most of the you know uh, when you go out in the morning early and sort of get I don't really go out in the morning early because I don't don't, I don't have a dairy farm uh so I don't need to I yeah I need to get out reasonably early because if I find anything wrong I've got not not got much daylight to deal with uh um but half of the cows are in the shed The, the, the the calves were all weaned about two three weeks ago so they're in the shed uh and the bull is in the shed on the other side um with a couple of steers to keep him company uh, but the, the rest of the cows are on the back of the hill about two miles away uh, so i so i have a nice drive out to to them either on the quad bike or, or in the tractor if i'm taking them some hay and that's when i listen to my my audio books um but yeah so that sounds very peaceful going across it is, it's wonderful one of the great things is if i'm writing and i and i'm stuck and i, yeah. I can't work out i can just get up go for a long walk, take mm. the dogs for a, for a long walk. And, and I've been, I, I mean, I realise I'm going to annoy an awful lot of people here, but I, you know, lockdown hasn't been that difficult for me because I can, I can step out the back door and go for a, a, an hour long, hour and a half walk without actually getting off my land. No. So um, you know, I don't have to worry too much about lockdown. No. Well, I'm sure that um, all your fans who are listening tonight, and there's been lots of questions, um, I think Karine has been typing furiously to get them all mm-hmm. out. So thank you so much, James, for joining us this evening. Um, and good luck with um, book 11 and book 12. Um, and well, also your you new, yeah. and your Constance, um, I can't remember her last name, Fairchild, that's it. Yeah, Constance yeah. Fairchild next book mm-hmm. as well. And I, yeah, I'll let you know how I enjoy natural causes. Um, the beginning definitely got yeah. me gripped. Well, I, hope, I hope you do. As I say, um, Ian Hanmore has done the most superb narration of those books. I'm really lucky to have had him for all 11 books. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Oh, I like, because I did like, yeah. I've, I liked his voice and I've read, I've had series before where they've changed them halfway through and, and it's sort of, it's ruined the thing. So I'm, I'm relieved yeah. to hear that. So I listen to quite a lot of Audible um, and sort of, we have borrow box at the library in Libby. So yeah. Um, So James's book is out now um, and you can order from the libraries, obviously, um, or buy from your local bookshop. So good luck, James. Thank you very much for joining us. um, And uh, we look forward to seeing you again, maybe in real life. Thank you very much. (laughs) Thank you. I, I look forward to it. Bye bye. Bye bye.